What's going on, everybody? This is Black Men Sundays. I'm your host, Corey Sylvester Murray. We're talking about generational wealth. We're talking about finance, and we're talking about business. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away. I refuse to be the man I was yesterday. Gotta put my best My man, Eric, from Hunts, Vegas, Alabama. Who do you have for our Black Men Sunday Spotlight? My spotlight today is on his brother, we all know, who is a football player, who's the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, no other than Patrick Mahomes. So my thing about Patrick Mahomes, it's been a revelation since becoming the starting quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, this brother, he is 25 years old. He's helped the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. He took home the Super MVP. And after this, winning MVP in 2018 with a 5,000-yard, 50-touchdown season in his first year as a starter. Now, the thing about Patrick Mahomes, he almost quit playing football when he was a sophomore in high school. However, he decided not to give up on his football uh, or give up on football, I should say, because he wanted to play alongside with his friends in high school. Now today, again, Patrick Mahomes is one of the highest paid athletes in the world. And he's on pace to be the greatest quarterback of all time. So the thing to this is never give up your dreams is the more of this. Now, again, Patrick Mahomes is one win away from clinching the Super Bowl. Well, not Super Bowl, but the playoffs. And he may be back to back. So Mahomes is mirroring Stephon Curry whose father also played in um, in professional sports. So that's the spotlight today. Patrick Mahomes, right back to you, Corey. Eric, man, thanks for that Black Men Sunday spotlight. I've noticed you've been giving a lot of um, hip-hop and sports figures lately. I'm catching that. I'm catching it, and I love it, man. Well, I'm just trying to change it up a little bit. You know, no, I love it. Some little stuff. So I'm going I'm to, like I said, try and change it up a little bit here and there. So. Well, you know, just like the way Hunts Vegas changing. I mean, didn't you tell me it was what? like the 20th place to live, the 20 best places to live? No, nah, brother, that's Orlando. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> no, nah, I know. I think the last time I saw it was like the top three best places, best cities to live. So um, right. I always like to mess with you on that. But thanks again for that Black Men Sunday spotlight, brother. Let's go on to introduce today's guest. We have Richard Cuff. This brother is the president of CTI Marketing. We're going to find out what that is. He's also the founder of the Nasimba Business Alliance. This brother, when we talk about generational wealth, this brother has the C-L-O-I-P mentality. This brother has a story to tell. We're going to dive right in. First off, Richard Cuff, man, welcome to Black Men Sundays, brother. How you doing? Corey, guys, thank you, man. I'm doing well. Thanks, guys, for having me on board. Yeah. I appreciate it. Definitely. And listen, man, you know, coming out of Jacksonville, Florida, you know, you're the mayor of Northwest Jacksonville, Dunn Avenue, but, you know, that's called Blossom Ridge for the brothers up in Jacksonville. But I want to dive right into this wealth conversation. Why shouldn't we worry about closing the wealth gap? Because it's impossible. Simple as that. When we're talking about closing the wealth gap as the gap between white wealth and black wealth, they got a 250, 300 year head start. You know, that's like closing the wealth gap on somebody. If I'm traveling from Jacksonville to New York and, you know, the person has got a four day head start on me, I'm not going to close that gap unless I can hop on an airplane or, you know, teleport there. But if we're talking about closing the wealth gap by using the same tools that they use to create it, we're never going to catch up. So either A, we've got to use a different tool to catch up which ain't nobody creating different tools. You guys were talking earlier about crypto. We can talk about the flaws and that, but, or B, you're never going to close the gap because they're 200 years from now, there'll be another 200 years ahead. So the best thing that we can do is as um, Booker T. Washington said, drop our buckets where we are, start right here and build from here going forward. Okay. Got you. And you know, when we talk about the wealth mentality, you have a CLOIP philosophy. Break that down for us. Yeah, I call it Chloe P. It's, it's what I call the five, but having a five or multi dimensional wealth consciousness. You hear a lot of brothers, especially if you, you on, on Instagram or any of these other places, everybody's dropping some sort of way to build your wealth, 10 extra business, six figure income, and all of that. But understanding the difference between the seven streams of income and the five 
dimensions of consciousness will make all the difference in the world. So I use Chloe P, C-L-O-I-P, to help you understand the five dimensions. The first dimension is where we all are, because even before we knew it, we were consuming wealth. Now, depending on the what end you are on as a consumer, you're either going to be the beneficiary or the benefactor. And the, the ones who are on the benefactor side, the ones who are giving the benefit or giving the opportunity, they get a chance to take advantage later on. Those who are taking the opportunity don't have anything to give after that. And so as consumers, when you get wealth, you consume wealth. And that's that person who might catch a lotto ticket, a parent dies, they, they get a sudden lump of change that drops in their lap, and the first thing they do is consume it. The next dimension is that L, that's the laborer. This is the person that figures it out. You know, I can't work at this job for 40 hours a week and expect to get rich, so I'm going to go out and work for myself, but get it myself. And that person can probably become wealthier than the consumer, and certainly if both the consumer and the laborer were working side by side, the laborer, by the very virtue of the fact that he has labor to put in and the consumer doesn't, the laborer will accumulate more wealth. The next one above that is, is the next, the higher dimension is the O, the owner. When you get to the point to where you're the owner of the wealth, that's when you wake up to that consciousness of I got to start my own business. But you don't want to have that kind of business that if you leave the business that I'm in D.C. right now, my business is in, in Jacksonville. It, it, I could probably stay here for a long, quite a few minutes up here and not have to go back to my business because it's taking care of itself. But eventually I'll have to go back and manage it. But that's the owner of wealth. The next level is the investor. Uh, obviously, the best place you can invest is in yourself, but where you can invest in other areas that create those multiple streams of income, you can see where you've broken past those first three dimensions and you're into that fourth dimensional wealth mindset. The fifth dimension is where everyone should aspire to get to, and that's the P. That's the philanthropist. So that philanthropist is giving off of his wealth, and now he's the one that's able to control it. John Rockefeller said it best. You want to own nothing but control everything. My goal in life is to own nothing. I don't want to have any cash. I don't want to have any resources. Everything is going to be in a trust. And by the time I hit my ultimate plan in life, it'll be mess. I'll be putting my name on buildings out of the trust funds that I have. So that's really the ultimate place that we're supposed to be. But there you have it. That's the, the five dimensions of wealth. Great. And I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the banking system, because in our pre-conversation, you said someone told you there's a lot of money out there. I think your quote was the FDIC bank um, really opened your eyes. So can you elaborate on that for the brothers? Yeah. Um, back in 2016, Congress finally implemented the Jobs Act of 2012. President Obama created jobs, J-O-B-S, Jumpstart Our Business Startups. You'll notice the Republicans have been dogging Obama out over Obamacare, Obamacare, Obamacare. Obama, in his first year, he passed two significant bits of legislation. First was the Jobs Act. He did that. I mean, the um, Affordable Care Act. He did that right away while he had Congress and the Senate. And he knew that by the midterms, he wasn't going to be able to do it. So he rammed the Affordable Care Act through. And then when Boehner and the rest got the House and the Senate, they pledged to make him a one-term president. In his final year, he didn't. He wasn't certain if he was going to have a second term. He decided to go for broke and pass his second big piece of legislation, which nobody talks about, the Jobs Act, Jumpstart Our Business Startups. I said um, they should call it the, the Break Us Negroes Off Some Act because that's really what it does. What it did was it changed the way investors can invest. You no longer have to be an accredited investor, which means have 250000 of income, million dollars of wealth or like a business that's worth three to $5 million to get in on ground floor, what's called PPM, private placement offerings. So you can buy stock at the very beginning. Well, that created this foundation for equity-based crowdfunding and the opportunity to get in on those levels. So when I started working in that space, I worked for one of the very first companies that was uh, registered FINRA approved portals. You can go to the FINRA website, which is FINRA is another of the it's FDIC on one side and FINRA is on the other side. But FINRA lists what's called these certified or, or approved portals that you can purchase um, stock through crowdfunding. 
the company that I was with was called uh, Breakaway Funding. And um, I knew nothing about I, what I thought I knew about business and banking. My, I, my mind was blown when I got into this level of banking to be able to, my job was to go into the FDIC website, look at community banks specifically and target the banks that had $10 billion or more. And here's what's crazy. The reason we were targeting banks with 10 billion, these are community banks with 10 billion or more is in the banking world. The banking world doesn't take your bank seriously if you don't have $10 billion. And when I looked at the numbers and saw, wait a minute, there are 6,800 community banks and the median of those banks is 10, 6,800 banks with $10 billion. My mind was just blown as to the money. And I, my mentor, as she, she sold her bank to start this company. And I said to her, Kim, I'm really appreciative for you giving me all this inside information. You know, I, I know you don't have to share this. This is 20 years worth of knowledge. You're, you're giving it to me and I appreciate it. And the way she said this is, is what I was sharing with you. She says, Richard, there's a lot of money out there, a lot of money. And the way she said, the calmness in her voice, it wasn't like she said, there's a lot of money out there, let's go get it. She was just recognizing that this is the, the way the game is. This is the atmosphere, this is the environment. And, and I feel like so many of us who are new to wealth, there's the French had a phrase, they say nouveau riche, new, newly rich. And in New Orleans, there were a lot of newly rich people. And that's where that term came from. But y'all have probably heard it as nigger rich because that's how it ended up being said. But it was those who are new to wealth don't know what to do with wealth. And those who are the old money, look at a person that's newly rich and they can look at him and tell, he don't know what to do with that money. He's new to it. He's a consumer. And I feel like that's, we're in this place that yes, we are new to this wealth game. But if we start recognizing that we can take lessons from those, I'm, and I'm not saying early, earlier I said we can't catch up, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from the mistakes that the, the American economy went through. If, if African-Americans were to start their economy today, Wall Street was started, it is said, when seven or eight brokers met under a buttonwood tree in New York and decided we need to organize or we're going to continue to be in chaos. And they organized Wall Street. And one of the first stocks that was traded was a company that manufactured slave ships. And so Wall Street literally was started on turning slave ships into shares of stock. And fast forward 200 years later, Wall Street is booming today. Can we come up, come together and start trading in a group of companies? They started with maybe 20 companies. And fast forward, look at where Wall Street is today. Can African-Americans do that, where we take our top 20 or our top 100 Black businesses that are selling shares of stock and start investing in those companies? I believe we can. Mm, great information, man. And, you know, as you said uh, from the Chloe P, the last P was philanthropist, and that's what you are. But I also see that you're a violinist as well. Um, and when I was looking at a story about you, one thing that touched me was that you basically said you'd rather put violins in kids' hands than guns. I thought that was was a strong, uh, strong soundbite from you. So can you just touch on that for us? Because a lot of people, a violinist, what? So go ahead. Yeah, no, and, I'm, and I'm, I'll be honest with you. When I first started the program, it was because I couldn't find a music program for my daughter. My daughter at the time, at two and a half years old, would walk around the house pretending to play the violin. Um, I didn't know where to take her to get violin lessons. I don't know why I didn't think to go to the Jacksonville Symphony and ask. Um, it would have shortened the curve, but for two and a half, three years, from maybe from the time she was four years old till about seven years old, I was doing it all myself. And then I learned that there was the Jacksonville Symphony. Long story short, I ended up being hired by the symphony as a consultant to help them build music programs. And the very first time I reached out to the media to tell them, hey, the Black community is connecting with the symphony. We're going to do a summer program. We're going to bring violins to our children. The reporter called me up and said she'd love to do the story. And I'm sitting there the whole time interviewing, and she's kind of throwing these questions that, were, that felt like the gotcha questions or the curveball questions. And I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? And she started asking me questions about crime. And if you if you watch that first video, there's a I say I say children have to learn to hurt, but they don't have to learn. They have to learn to hate, but they don't have to learn to hurt. 
what they have to learn to do is to put the hurt somewhere that it doesn't turn into hatred. And then I went on with the conversation. Let's talk about violins. When the news story came out, she led into the story with business leaders on the north side, happy, hoping to get guns out of the hands of children with these violins. I'm like, what the hell? That wasn't the pitch. What happened though, for about the next eight years, I could never get the Jacksonville News to cover a story on our children unless it was on the heels of a five-year-old getting killed or a 12-year-old getting shot. Or, and every time that happened, they'd call me up and say, Richard, can we do a news story? And then they'd come over to our center, bring the cameras. So I said, hell, if that's what's going to get y'all over here, yes. This is a program designed to get guns out of the hands of kids and violence because I needed the media to tell my story. Now, I don't need the media. I don't go to the media. Hell, I create my own media in order to tell my story. So our program, yes, by putting violins in the hands of a child, they don't go toward guns, but that's with anything, right? My, my daughter didn't have time for ice skating or roller skating, or she didn't have time for, she practiced four to six hours a day, 25 years old. Now she has her master's degree in violin performance. You don't get a master's degree and be working toward your PhD by distractions. But here's the point that I did make with our, our music program. I told the sheriff of Jacksonville, I said, you will never see a 16 year old on his way to a violin recital, put down his violin and go and rob a convenience store. You will never see that. So therefore I can tell you where the next 16 year old gang member is when he's 14, about to start the game, I can tell you where that 14-year-old is. He's four years old in preschool. And if we can reach him there, we won't have to worry about whether he puts a gun in his hand because we can put a violin in his hand. So yes, technically, our program is about using violins to um, get them away from guns. But technically, all we're doing is giving them a pathway that they can walk. And par pardon me, I didn't catch the brother's name earlier, but you guys were talking about the Bitcoin and his master's degree in uh, public policy. You can put a child at four years old on a path to a degree in public policy. You can put them on a path to a degree in, as an architect. At four years old, this child, 95% of his brain will develop between birth and five. And then from five to 24 years old, the other 10% will develop. So what's the most critical time to reach a child in, in their development phase is birth to five years old. And that's where I put all my philanthropic efforts. Great information. And let's talk about the, the PS factor. Oh man, you, you just, <laughs> hey. are we, are we not playing out here? This Black Bruh. Mill Sundays, baby, let's get it. So on top of what I do as a, as a philanthropist, as an entrepreneur, business, business development consultant, it, it, this wasn't called coaching back when I, I was doing it 40 years ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm 63 now. So when I was 22 years old, my mentor was this crazy talking guy named Les Brown. And um, Les wasn't the Les Brown that everybody knows today. He was back in Miami and Les was basically a community advocate. And I started volunteering to help Les do what he was going to do out in the community. That's why I, I truly support Les and what he's doing right now. I've seen him grow and he, he has walked the talk. Before he started the talk, he was walking it. And he took it to the next level and he brought his message to the world. So that inspired me to create my Get Ready for Greatness program. And I've been doing that for about three decades. And I, about, for about 10 years, I started doing a, a workshop called the Understanding the Basics of Business Ownership Lunch and Learn Workshop. And within that workshop, I would explain the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule. And most entrepreneurs don't understand this and don't recognize that this is why they are failing. The 80-20 rule says 80% of where you put your attention or effort is only going to bring you 20% of your success, while where you put 20% of your attention or effort is going to bring you 80% of your success. Logic would tell you, focus on the area that you're going to get the 80% of your success. The problem is with a business owner, he has to put 80% of his attention on the PS, the product or the service. And therefore, the other 20% go toward marketing, accounting, and customer service. 
when that light bulb went off in my mind 30 years ago, I went, hell, let me start a management company that will do marketing, accounting, and customer service, and I'll just get clients. And I've got a 30-year career, 30-plus years as a result, because I know that entrepreneurs only focus on that product or service. When the business starts going down, they focus more on the product and service. You never hear an entrepreneur say, oh my God, my business is failing. I need to go call an accountant. They don't do that. They try to sell more product and that's where you begin to fail. Well, if you can take that PS, the product or service and change it to a mindset, now it's not a set of activities, it's a way of thinking. And if you can change your way of thinking now, you can be successful. And so, so I started calling that the PS factor. And uh, it allowed me to say, okay, the P is for the physical and the S is for the spiritual. And when you can balance the two and operate on a daily balance where you are not canceling out your, your spiritual energy and your spiritual energy is not canceling out your, your physical energy. I'll give you a perfect example. Have you ever gone into a, a barbershop or store or restaurant that's owned by a Christian, a black you know, black entrepreneur, but they are really, really Christian. God has blessed them. And they got gospel music playing and they got a cross on, they got Jesus on the wall and, and Bible verses on the menu and, and everything. What are they? Their spiritual self has overtaken the physical and they're not consciously aware that they're doing, or maybe they are and don't care. But there are a lot of customers that would walk right past that place and go to the bar on the corner because they're automatically saying, this is not for me. And if you can find a way to balance your life, your physical and your spiritual, and find that balance, you'll create the energy that starts attracting success to you. So that's what the PS factor is. It's your level of conscious awareness of your natural God-given ability to attract a successful outcome in any given situation. And it begins with understanding what you are doing to distract. Long before you will attract, you have to stop with the distract. So identify with distracting success. And it's like taking your foot off the brake and watching your car speed up. Just by taking your foot off the brake, you didn't even press the accelerator. So identify the distractors first, and then you can turn on what I call EPME, extremely positive mental energy. And that extremely positive mental energy will help you attract success through your PS factor, that level of conscious awareness. Very, very good point. And I asked you that because, you know, talking about the PS factor, talking about success that leads to me, you know, you're the mayor of Northwest Jacksonville, Blossom Ridge, Dunn Avenue for the brothers from Jacksonville. Talk about the success and the positive things and the movement that's going on in that community. The reason why my friends, they jokingly call me the mayor of Blossom Ridge, because there's an area of Jacksonville, the north side. If, if you're from Jacksonville, Jacksonville is just one big city. So if you were to create a big circle and just draw a line that kind of goes from the bottom left, like if we are looking at a clock, go from the eight o'clock curve around to the middle to three and split that in half, the north side would be all black and the south side would be all white. And, the, and it's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the money is on the south side, 20% is on the north side, but 80% of the crime is on the north side and 20% is on the south side. So when I would tell people, you know, they say, where do you live? I say, I live off Dunn Avenue. They go, oh, that's the north side. And, you know, the north side is the crime. North side is the poverty. North side is the stay away from that. I'm like, no, you guys have to come to Dunn Avenue and see that it's solidly middle class. It's the wealthiest area of Black people in North Florida, practically. But you got to come over there to see it for yourself. People wouldn't come. The media wouldn't come. So I made the decision. And I got this from a good a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Whitman Mayo, who played the played Grady on Sanford and Son, uh, said to me once as, as he was coaching, or and, and it was only about a 10-minute conversation, but he inspired me to become exec, a, a producer of a television show of my, for my friend. He challenged us by saying, no revolution has ever begun with the masses. It's always two or three people who get together and decide to change things. And when he said that to me back in 1988, within three months, I was executive producer of a television talk show at 28 years old. Fast forward 2015, I decided I'm tired of that community that's north of the Trout River. 70,000 people live in this community and it's all called the North Side. But if it was a city all by itself, it would be a city with about three murders every year. 
Imagine a city of 70,000 people with three murders. If people would be flocking trying to get there, that's what that community is. And so I live where there are two streets. One was called Pine Estates. And I would say, man, we could rename this community Pine Estates, but that sounds too hoardy toity And then there was the other street, <laughs> like, hey, well, let's, let's go up to Pine Estates, you know? <laughs> the hoardy toity Negroes live up there. So I, I decided the other street, Blossom Ridge, didn't sound so hoity toity. And that's the it's literally the street that leads into my subdivision. I said, that's a good name. So I put out a press release. Uh, we I, because of my nonprofit organization, we 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 brought some of the children from our music program. We partnered with Starbucks. Uh, we brought out the searchlights and we made the announcement that this area of Northwest Jacksonville from this point forward will now be called Blossom Ridge. And so now I'm working to lobby the city leaders to get, a, get it officially recognized as a business district. So the Blossom Ridge Business District, our income level is too high for it to be considered an economic empowerment zone because low income, it's not a low income area. So we're in that catch 22 phase where we, we make too much to be considered low income and get government incentives, but we don't make enough to attract private money to build corporate businesses. So my goal, obviously, is to build it up because I darn sure I am not about to allow the community to go down to where we finally have, you know, 300 murders a year and then we can get government funding. But that's 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 pretty much what Blossom Ridge is. It, it started out as a vision, more of frustration, a frustration of being recognized as a crime ridden community when, in, in fact, it's one of the wealthiest areas in Jacksonville, but also taking back the right to identify us as a progressive, wealth-creating city that's not just what the media says we are. We're going to tell you who we are, and, and that is Blossom Ridge. Is there a generational shift going on right now? Oh, certainly, certainly. In fact, let me tell you what. If you want to see it, look up at the White House. Joe Biden celebrating his 80th birthday. Also, his granddaughter is having a wedding at the White House. Now, why is that significant? Joe Biden is probably going to leave this earth within the next decade or so. He'd be lucky if he makes it to 20, I mean, to 100 years. Um, but if he does make it for another 20 years, God bless him. But more than likely within this next 20 years, Joe Biden is going to die. And I guarantee you, when he leaves this earth, that granddaughter of his is going to get broke off something real nice. Well, there are millions of Joe Bidens about to leave this earth in the next 20 years. Um, Paris Hilton's grandfather was one of them. Paris was set to inherit the, her whole family, something like $35 billion. And Paris pissed grandpa off and he donated it all to charity. But that's two examples. But you take that and multiply it times 10, 15 million, you got over $63 trillion of wealth that's about to change hands in the next 20 years. And it's going to grandchildren. And, and some, some, I give a good 10% are ready for it. They know what to do with it. I'd say another 10% don't know what the heck to do with it. And they're going to blow it. They, they're at the sea level, okay? They're, they're going to be the consumers of it. The rest of the battle is going to be fought in that LOI level, that the laborer, the owner, and the investor. And I think that that's where most of the money is going to fall. Now, again, it's not going to fall in the hands of Black people. And once again, what's going to happen? That 250-year head start that they have, they're going to catapult another 100 years with that $63 trillion that's not falling in our hands. So what should we be doing? There is going to be a transition of wealth within the Black community. It may be about 10% of that 63 trillion, but that's still $6.3 trillion of wealth that's about to be transferred from my generation to my son and my grandson. And if we can take the financial advisors, the people who have those degrees in, in politics and, and finance, and, and we can begin to map out a strategy as if we were our own nation, then we can take advantage of this next transfer of wealth. If not, we're going to flatline, just like we've been doing for the last 30, 40 years, and nothing is going to change for us. But I am under the firm belief 
that the next 20 years is going to see a, a tremendous change in the financial status of black people, especially because of what black men like yourself and others are doing. Hey, yeah, this is a uh, Kalali Dogbe. Um, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually, I guess, I guess, welcome to the area, to the DC area. I'm, at, I'm actually out in Maryland, in uh, Calvin County, Prince Frederick, Maryland. So, not too far from you, about a, about an hour from DC. Hour, uh, yeah, hour from DC. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, given uh, just as you said, it's it, it's tough to see uh, a, a closure of um, the generational uh, wealth gap between uh, black and white people. Um, aside from because you already because you already gave a, a pretty good uh, synopsis of it. Uh, aside from, could you go a little bit more into aside from developing a kind of a, a, a national uh, economic strategy? Uh, for Black people as this wealth transfer is coming on. Could you uh, go into a little bit more about what you think about how we could use our um, wealth uh, as influence to kind of influence and change the conditions a little bit more to be more favorable, um, not just for like Black people to get more wealth, but just, just for wealth to be a little bit more accessible for everybody in general? Sure. This is the way, the way that I, I like to frame the conversation is say that if if we were all you know, you, you've heard the, um, the, the analogy of certain that if, if you were to blindfold a bunch of people and put them around an elephant, tell them to touch the elephant and describe what they're touching, everybody would describe something different. In physics, that's called a frame of reference so or reference frames. And just based solely on where you are standing and what you are looking at, the world looks totally different, right? So this, this reference frame mindset is where we have to begin, understanding that everybody's going to look at the world of finance differently. So you tell one person, I've got to, um, we've got to pay for the street to be paid. We all can agree that we need the streets paid in front of our, our homes. How are we going to get it paid for? The first person says, well, we can pay for it by raising property taxes. Well, hell, I own half the property on the block. I ain't for raising property taxes. You see, from my reference frame, raising taxes is not going to get it. Uh, but, you know, your reference frame is going to be different. So if we argue over reference frames, we're not going to get anywhere. What we have to do is change our frame of reference. So when we change the frame of reference, we can make the frame of reference something in the far off distance. And here's where politicians are using that. Because the moment somebody like Obama comes along and takes your frame of reference off your individual stuff and gets you to this point to where, yes, we can, we're going to do it together. We all, and then you got black people and white people, they have changed their frame of reference now and they're looking toward a better future. And it's the same future. They're what do the, what the Republicans do? Oh, it's going to be pretty scary out there. Oh, you're going to get jacked at the gas station. Oh, they're going to be coming over the border. See, that now the best thing that they can do is insert fear. So if we can put in our reference frame as, as Black people or as anybody trying to build wealth, and let's say, let's imagine three big mountains way out in the future, way out, 100 miles, but they're, the mountains are 100 miles away, but you can see those three mountains. You see how cool that is? Now, what, that, what does that mean? Everybody, no matter where you are, can pretty much look in that direction and see those mountains. They're so tall, you can't help but see them. It's like looking at the moon, right? So now let's go toward those three mountains. And what are those three mountains? Mountain number one is group economics. Mountain number two is generational wealth. And mountain number three is political alliances. And if we can understand how those three mountains as a frame of reference influence our individual reference frames, then we can understand how people are going in different directions in just simply describing the mountain that they're not even on yet. But, you know, if the Republicans get the mountain, it's going to be crazy. If the Democrats get the mountain, it's going to be socialist. Who gives a crap about who gets it? The mountain is 100 miles away. What we need to do is get to stepping and moving in a direction to say, as for me and my house, and that's where I believe we should go to, that if we we identify the three mountains that we're going to work toward, then we can collectively create our families. So you get a family and you get a family and you get a family and everybody's got a family. And then if we can give each family the same resources, 
to help them connect to those future frames of reference, then you'll start noticing different reference frames will start com coming combining. You'll find this family thinks like that family, then they form a group. And this family thinks like that family, they form a group. And then next thing you know, this group thinks like that group and they form a bigger group. And before long, we're just kind of moving along. Maybe we don't all look exactly the same as we come together as groups, but we're at least heading in the same direction. So uh, what a friend of mine said this to me, Hell, back when I was in the army, 21 years, 20 years, 40 years, oh, damn, 40 years ago, he said, if you move one pebble, the world will never be the same. And man, that to me is my frame of reference, you know? And so, as, and, and when I use that as my frame of reference, then my reference frame is just move the ball, move the needle a little bit, do today what I can get done today, go to bed tonight, knowing that just appearing on a podcast was enough for today. And then tomorrow I'll do whatever I need to do tomorrow to move the needle a little bit more. Because, you know, what you're talking about seems like you're pretty sharp on um, building coalitions. Yes. Uh, but could you could you just talk to us a little bit about the uh, just the importance of just like networking and building those coalitions? And could you give us a little bit of advice on on how to do that? Because it seems to me like I, I could I just speak from my own personal experience. A lot of the people that I know, even brothers, I know, like that's one of the reasons why we we start uh, why Corey started this podcast was just because like we know that that a lot of times people hold hold information to themselves and they don't network where they should they don't keep their hands open and share information where they should and, and sometimes that ke keeps us it keeps us from identifying those three peaks that you're talking about and then it keeps us from figuring out those strategies we can to get together like even the three peaks you talk about particularly if you're talking about political alliance or you're talking about any kind of collective action then you need to be able to build coalitions and networks mm -hmm. to support that so um, yeah, could you just give us some advice on on how we do that, how we how we build strong networks and how we build good coalitions? No, the, the number one thing I think that it has to be building or or assessing your level of conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. um, because we what we do is we think we're consciously aware, but there is, you know, there's unconscious, there's conscious and then there's consciously aware. And each one of those is a higher level of, of thinking. But if, if I were to sum up everything that you just said, are you consciously aware that you are describing it to me without saying it? I'm hearing it, but you're not consciously aware that I'm hearing it. Now, now you're going to be consciously aware that I just heard you say, can we please stop being crabs in a barrel? Right? You, you see that? Without saying it. You don't realize you're saying it, but that's what you're saying, right? Okay, okay so yeah. What I, now that's unconsciously, now you're conscious of it, right? But now let's go consciously aware. Remember, PS factor is your conscious awareness of your ability to change it, right? So where's the first place you can change it? Within yourself. Before you try to change it within anybody else, we got, we got this crabs in a barrel mentality. Well, let's, you change it first. Stop thinking of it as crabs in a barrel, or at the very least, think of it the way the crab think about it, right? Right? So what, what if, when they're describing crabs in a barrel, what are they saying? Oh, when one tries to come out, the other crab's pulling back, right? But change your frame of reference and think of it as a crab. Your best friend, Willie, has been in this barrel with you for I don't know how long. You watched him grow up. Y'all been poking each other on the side and chilling. And then suddenly somebody reaching in and grab Willie. Are oh, you going to reach up and try to grab him and pull him back? No, nah, you can't take Willie out the barrel. No, you'll take me. Take me too. Hey, guys, grab him. The crabs are trying to help him. The crabs ain't trying to pull him back. And hell, where is he going? He's going out of the barrel into a damn boiling pot of hot water. He ain't going nowhere special. So you <laughs> What you have to do is change your frame of reference, change the way you look at it. Look at it differently. Even if you look at something humorously, it changes everything about it. You know, do pull a gun on you. Man, you're going to shoot me with that little thing? I bet you, you bro, you compensating for something? See, whatever. <laughs> that, do whatever you possibly can to first change the way you are looking at it. And then, Look at the person to your left and to your right 
and see if they are still looking at it the same way. And if, if they are, then you do everything within your power to change the way they are looking at it. I do, I do this thing called the paperclip test with my clients. And the idea is to help you understand the, the futility of trying to use particular systems, the same thing to solve the same problem, mm -hmm. right? So let's take a paperclip and let's say in my hand is one paperclip and then the palm of my hand is the solution. I put the paper clip in my hand and I make a fist. Is my fist a good system for holding paper clips? Absolutely. I can run around the world with the clenched fist. But tomorrow, let's double it, two paper clips. Let's double it again, three paper, four paper clips, and eight. I get up to day 10, I've got 512 paper clips. Day 11, I add three zeros to the one. So every 10 days after that, you can add three zeros. It's one, you can do the math. It's 1,048 paper clips on day 21, I mean, day 11. On day 21, you have 1,048,576 paper clips. Mm. Day 30, you've doubled to 536,870,912 paper clips. Let me ask you this. Is the palm of your hand a good system for holding 536 million paper clips? Now, nah, you know what happened? The palm of your hand failed the paper clip test. And if the palm of my hand is going to fail the paper clip test, I want to know it as soon as possible. How cool would it be to know that that's not going to work with one as opposed to getting out there and find out after I'm undercapitalized, overstressed or whatever the case is, that the system that I thought would work doesn't work. So the goal is change the system first, the way of thinking. And when you get that way of thinking, then you today will be one person. You talk to one of your friends tomorrow, and that's two of you. And each one of you talk to another one the next day, and there's four of you. And the next day, there's eight and 16. In 21 days, you've got over a million people who think like you think. That, my friend, is the paperclip test. That's what I want you to start thinking, that you're just one person right now. But as you work on yourself, and then you help this person next to you change just a little bit, his reference frame changes, and then you both have the same frame of reference, then you can, get, you can start moving. So you can use that analogy of three peaks off in the distance. But if it's a smaller group, you can have a closer you know, goal. But it's the same goal. We're going to build our company up and we're going to make a million and a half dollars next year. If everybody is focused on that same goal and they got the same mindset, you understand the PS factor, you're going to attract the success because the success is already out there. You don't have to go and create success. You just have to manifest it, meaning manually put yourself in the position of success. I want to share with you how you can tell when you are beginning to move to a higher level. You start seeing coincidences. And the first way you start seeing, for me, I don't know if it'll work this way for everybody, but for me, it's been this way. I could be reading a book while I'm watching the evening news. And the sentence that I'm reading might say, you know, she was very excited when she saw her husband and she nearly jumped off. She felt like she could jump off a cliff. And the moment I say the words, read the words off a cliff, the news anchor says the car fell off the cliff. I mean, at the exact same time I'm reading it, the anchor is saying it. It has happened so many times now that it's no longer a coincidence. I am consciously aware that I'm just vibrating at a different level. Now I'm saying, OK, well, what else am I supposed to notice? Then the next level, you start noticing the beauty around you. You start noticing how things come together and form shapes. And, and then, of course, then you start building out a reference frame. You start becoming conscious of where you are in relationship to that which you are observing. And then when you finally get to the point where you're on the outside looking in, that's where the magic happens. Because now you can start. It's like you're looking down at yourself and you're saying, huh. I think I'd like to wear a blue suit today. And just by looking at yourself, change your suit. You you just, the you that you're looking at, just say, oh, I think I'll change a blue suit. And you're like, wow, I was just thinking about that. Yes, that's your energy, the power that you have to shape your universe. And I think you're absolutely right. Crypto is a bunch of hype, right? But let me tell you why crypto is hype. Because I think crypto was never intended to have a value. Crypto was intended to have a quantity. So the, the, the quantity means that you can limit the quantity of whatever comes in. And so that value that comes in on the crypto, if um, originally uh, the person that created it, 
created in such a way that there's a finite number of coins. And because of that finite number, the, the thought was scarcity would increase the value. Right. But it's that the coins represent a packet. It's like, think of it like, you know, blockchain, right? So if each coin was a, a, a container, like the little squares on the container ship, that's what the coin should represent, a container, that's all. It's what you put in the coin into the container that makes it valuable. So if I want to say to you, hey, I got 10 Bitcoins or whatever the case is, I'll give you 10 Bitcoins for that Obama picture right there behind you. You can either say yes or no. It's not the value of the coin. It's how many coins am I willing to give you? And if the value of that picture should be what changes, not the coin. So if I said, I'll give you 10 coins, you go, no, nah, my brother, you got to give me 100. Wow. I go, OK, well. I don't know. I gave you 50. You say, give me 75. I say, I give you 60. Then I end up giving you 60 coins. But now I got to go and get 60 more coins from somewhere else. And see, the number of coins is, is what should be moving the transactions. And the value should be on what we're receiving after we've made the transaction using the coins, not the coins themselves. Right. And, and, and I just said, gold has no value. I mean, is <laughs> the, the value is what we say it is so that's the whole thing so it's like just like you said so if the value so like like you said if you wanted to give me 60 60 bitcoins for this for this poster right you want to yeah. give bitcoins for this poster right okay you give me 60 bitcoins for this poster we go on stock market right now we see what 60 bitcoins is, is worth today right tomorrow it could be worth half what it is today it yeah. could be worth double what it is today i don't know you don't know. Mm -hmm. So how in good faith, how can we in good faith, which is what we talk about when we talk about currency, right? How can right. we in good faith make a transaction based on that? Yeah. We don't but, but imagine if, and I don't know if the if the guy who created it created it in such a way that the, the value could automatically go up. He created it that the more you mine the coins for the transaction, I got a hundred coins, I'm gonna give you a hundred coins, but the miner gets a certain amount just to verify the as, the, as it moves along the block. Mm -hmm. And that process creates more coins. Mm -hmm. That was the whole idea, is that the more you transact the coin, the more coins that get produced. Gotcha. And the, the more coins you have, the more you can do. So it's not like remove value from Bitcoin and just say it, it, it just, I don't know, it's a placeholder. It's a it's a representation of a desire to, you know, do something. <laughs> it's like how much? How much is it? I don't know. It's just, it's just. Well. And that and that was my so so the way we started the conversation was you know I I, I give I always give Corey like I say I, I give Corey bad props because he I, I think on every podcast. He's like, you know, this is my boy Kalali. He's got a master's degree in public policy, blah blah blah. And I'm always kind of like, eh, don't talk about my degree. Yeah. But but what, but we were saying at the beginning, we were saying, well, what that really means is that, you know, like those. And, and unfortunately for Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't really have 200 page white papers. But you know, the white papers that people like print out and they 200 papers pages yeah. and nobody reads them. And wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the guy that reads them. I'm <laughs> you know? I'm the guy that reads them too. That's right. <laughs> I read them too. Yeah. So, so it's like, so when I read and I get to the bottom of your paper and it's like, oh yeah, it's supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't do X, Y, or Z, you know? And then, and then I'll say like, you know, we're in a social media age right now. So I'll say something like that. Or I'll say something on social media. Or I'll say something to somebody like, yeah, you know, crypto is probably just like a pump and dump scheme. Really? You know, I said this, like, I said this on the first session we had on crypto and then you know, people were like, well, how do you know? Blah, 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 this and that and third. And I'm like, well, because I, it's kind of what I do for a living. <laughs> like, you know? But when you're on the internet or when you're somewhere else, it's like people just think, take your opinion as just, you're saying something that you think, like it's your opinion. It's like, no, it's not my opinion. It's what I know. So yeah. I know, based on, you know, that's why I know based on my area of academic study. But, you know, if you don't believe in academic study, then... <laughs> Well, how many how many different cryptos are there now? Something like nineteen thousand. Oh, it, it's it's ridiculous, and that's the other thing. It's like, look, you can't currency don't work that way. Like, you can't yeah. have nineteen thousand different currencies. It's a currency. It's it's 
it's a tender of sale. Like it's something that's supposed to be used to buy and sell something. So it's like, that means it has to be guaranteed by somebody. So who is your currency guaranteed by? We, you're not get, Bitcoin isn't even traded on a regulated market. So it's not guaranteed by anybody. Or I, I think maybe Bitcoin is regulated now. Yeah. But, but there's only a couple, like Bitcoin and Ethereum are like the only ones that are traded on regulated markets. All the rest of those coins are on the unregulated market. It means they're not backed up by anybody. They're guaranteed by whoever made it, basically. Here is, here is if, if they were to treat Bitcoin as opposed to the currency, Bitcoin should be the interest on the currency. So look at what... I think what they, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean so you see what the feds are doing with the interest rates, right? So the economy gets too hot, they raise the interest rate. The economy slows down, they lower the interest rate. The interest rate is a driver of how fast or slow the money moves. It's not the money itself. That, the power of the interest rate is it could stop a $400,000 transaction dead in its tracks. Because if, if when yeah, I, I was about that house yesterday, it was 2% interest on the loan. Now it's 12% interest. I'm like, I don't think I want it. I want that, right. <laughs> right, right. I want that. So if Bitcoin did the same thing, meaning that it, rather than having these high fluctuations, it was a steady fluctuation. And so what came into the market was more coins then I am attaching a coin to a purchase or I'm attaching a coin to something and that number stays consistent, then what I should be trying to do is go out and get more coins. That's why the miners, these computers that create the coins, that's right. why they, that's where the real business at is in their mind. They want to generate more coins. They don't care about how the price goes up or down. We want the volume in the coins. So well, the problem they did with Bitcoin was they capped it. You can't you can't create bitcoins inf infinitely. They ca it's supposed to. They, and nobody even knows when it's going to stop. But I'm, I, I think they said sometime in 2025. It's like you're supposed to reach a certain amount of bitcoin. I think it's I don't know 20,000 bitcoins or something like that. And after you get to 20,000, you can't make any more bitcoin. Right. So then well, you start what I what I what I see us doing is beginning to start doing. These communities, these different coins that are out there are going to create ways for us to start um, um, doing business with each other. And um, the currency and all that other stuff, that's going to burn off very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the next phase for us mm -hmm. is to start those going back to those those three peaks in the in the distance, the group mm -hmm. economics, generational wealth and political alliances. Mm -hmm. I'd say the average family is going to be focused on two out of the three. Most families are going to be focused on only one. But, you know, I, I don't have the luxury of, of two out of three. I got to stay focused on all three of them because my whole system is driven by keeping account of what's happening on each one of those peaks. Okay. So I am looking forward to um, to what's to come. And I, I love this conversation. You guys Good stuff, man. Oh, I see my brother, um, Robert, actually uh, put his question in the chat. He, okay. said, he said, aside from teaching and spreading knowledge in our communities, what's your plan for the next five years? My plan? Well, for the for the next five years, um, I, I didn't share this. Last year, my wife passed away. So August 15th. And, you know, my, we, we've been together for 25 years. And obviously, we're planning another 25 if, if God gave me that long on this earth. Um, but when she passed away, uh, her background was um, finance. She was uh, worked for Fidelity Investments, so she had all of her her licenses and everything. And I had some serious restrictions, things that I could not do because it conflicted with her licenses, or or we were always having to send some letter to the SEC or whatever the case is to see if it conflicted with their rules. And I just said, screw it, I'm not going to do any of that and stay out of it. So I I got heavily into philanthropy and working with children. So um, I still have that love. So sort of in the next five years, I'm going to do a handoff. I'm, I'm building out my nonprofit organization so that we I can bring people in who, who have the real background to build a nonprofit and take it nationally because I want to then ramp back up and get back into business because now I'm not planning on retiring anymore with my wife gone. So I plan on at least spending the next 15 years um, being heavily into business and probably another 10 years after that, like a Warren Buffett, 
just walk up in the meeting with a yellow pad and a pen and talk shit. You know, that's that's <laughs> that's that's what I want to do. Uh, but the the next five years is going to be pivotal because pivotal because we'll be tr- I'll be transitioning out of my philanthropic nonprofit work and back into the um, the world of business and venture capital. So I, I hope to have quite a few investments in some of these uh, emerging businesses that I'm seeing. And there's some brothers that are doing and sisters that are doing some amazing, amazing work in the world of uh, business that's attracting some some really serious capital. And I, I want to be in on that. I'm not the I'm not the crypto expert. I do recognize that crypto is not going to go anywhere. Um, the other thing is the way crypto is designed, it's never going to be able to look like our traditional banking system. So, I mean, people are using their Fidelity Investments, in fact, is, is just now introducing its plat- its crypto investing platform. So, you know, that's going to be pretty interesting to see what uh, Fidelity is doing. But there, I guarantee you Fidelity is not interested in whether or not you make money or whether or not it crashes because just like with the stock market, it could crash. Fidelity makes its money on the transactions up or down. They're going to make their money. So people who are dealing in currencies are often interested more in the transaction than the currency itself. Um, and if you're making, you know, half a penny on a tran- on a billion transactions a day, you're doing all right. Well, Richard Cuff, man, did you enjoy yourself on Black Men Sunday today? Bro, I love it. I'm looking forward to coming back. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you want to come back. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to uh, talk, put you on my on my calendar. You know, I'm old school. I've still got my Rolodex, so got to put you in that. <laughs> Same here. I'll put you on mine too. Have your people get with my people. Definitely. I'll, I'll have my assistant call you. But thanks for coming on Black Men Sundays. We appreciate all the wealth of knowledge. I mean, we've talked about everything from philanthropy to the Chloe P to the mindset to wealth creation. I mean, we hit it all. So thanks for coming on the show and enjoy the rest of your day, brother. We out of here. All right. Take care. Bye, yes, guys. Yes, sir. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away.